Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. This is video E of a series of blood videos. We'll focus here on hemostasis. Hemostasis is a fancy word that says stasis, the stopping of blood flow. Hemo referring to blood. This is not the same thing as clotting. Hemostasis is a broader process that includes clotting. So clotting is part of hemostasis. Hemostasis consists of three phases that occur in this order. First, there is the so-called vascular phase, followed by the platelet phase, and then clotting. So notice that clotting is part of hemostasis, but hemostasis has two additional phases that occur. So let's create a scenario of you cutting your finger with a knife as you were cutting veggies in the kitchen, let's say. That cut, that wound, created injury to the smooth muscle that we find in our blood vessel walls. And this is, this is literally going to cause those uh, muscle cells to contract. And as they do that, they create the constricting of our blood vessels called vasoconstriction. So the damage to uh, our blood vessel wall triggers the release of all kinds of chemicals by various cells, even including the platelets themselves, to where we see vasoconstriction occur. Of course, vasoconstriction is a good thing because then the vessels begin to narrow, making it harder for the blood to escape. Injury to our blood vessels also leads to exposed collagen fibers. Remember that our basement membrane of the simple squamous epithelium that is called the endothelium of uh, blood vessels. Um, those, those collagen fibers are going to now become exposed and that makes the ends of the blood vessels rather sticky. So not only are we vasoconstricting, now we see that the ends of our blood vessels also become sticky to where the, the ends start to now almost, they'll almost try to glue together, again making it difficult for blood vessels, for blood to escape, plus that stickiness causes our platelets to adhere and that leads us to our next phase. So the vascular phase allows for the next phase called the platelet phase, platelet plug phase to kick in. This vascular phase can continue during the next phase, but it has to start first. So in the platelet phase or the platelet plug phase, we see that because of the stickiness created by the exposed collagen fibers, our platelets begin to adhere, so they begin to uh, stick to the blood vessel wall, and that causes them to change shape and become rather spiky and even more sticky, and then that results in them releasing their chemicals, or we call that degranulation. Some of these chemicals promote even more stickiness to where more platelets get stuck. And you can see now that we start to form a plug of platelets due to the fact that more and more and more platelets stick to one another or aggregate. Some of those chemicals are also going to release, are also going to promote vasoconstriction. So the chemicals are going to be promoting more plug formation as well as vasoconstriction. So the formation of the platelet plug is once again going to prevent the loss of too much blood. Now, there are many chemicals that play a role in the formation of the plug and the promotion of the of vasoconstriction. I've listed some here I'd like for you to be familiar with. ADP, adenosine phosphate, serotonin, and something called thromboxane A2. And then there's a variety of prostaglandins as well as phospholipids that all play a role in either the formation of the platelet plug, vasoconstriction, or 
even in the activation of clotting factors such that the next phase can occur, the clotting phase. I must mention though that the platelet phase is very dependent on a clotting factor that we refer to as the von Willebrand factor. If a person does not, have, does not produce enough von Willebrand factor, a person cannot really uh, stop the flow of blood very well. Or if they have too much of it, they will form too many clots. A person that doesn't clot well um, suffers from hemophilia. So again, this leads us to the next phase, the clotting phase. Another way of referring to clotting is coagulation. Again, this is part of hemostasis. Hemostasis consists of first the, the um, vascular phase, which then allows for the platelet phase to kick in. And as those two phases are going, we can see the coagulation or clotting phase kick in. This is when our blood is going to trans form from a liquid to more of a gel-like substance. Now, this requires, in addition to the two prior phases, clotting factors. And we can also refer to them as procoagulants. There are a total of 13 of these procoagulants, and you see them on this diagram um, shown how they play a role in activating one another. They all get Roman numerals and those that have the little, little letter A indicated, for instance, uh, Roman numeral 12 with the little, little letter A, implies this little letter A means that they have become activated. So what am I trying to tell here? When they're floating around in your blood plasma, these procoagulants are inactive. Almost all of those procoagulants are inactive enzymes, better referred to as proenzymes. And they must become activated. And once they become activated, we put a little A underneath their number. There are just two procoagulants that are not enzymes. That is calcium. Calcium is a clotting factor, but it's not a protein or enzyme. It's clotting factor four. And then there's something called tissue factor, which is also abbreviated TF, and it's clotting factor three. It actually has even more synonyms, as I'll explain in a moment. If we again look at this diagram, notice that the order of all of our clotting factors is not according to what number they are. You also don't have to memorize this pathway by any means, except for what I'm about to show you. And we'll go into that in just a moment. Many clotting factors, in order for them to function, are going to require a vitamin, namely vitamin K. Our large intestines, bacteria, because we have bacteria living in our large intestine, can make some of our vitamin K and some vitamin K we have to ingest. So we have to have a proper level of vitamin K to go through the coagulation phase. So when I showed you the whole coagulation um, diagram on the previous slide, it's, it's pretty complex and by no means do you have to memorize that. But you do need to know this flow chart. And what this illustrates to you is that the whole process of clotting consists of three major pathways. We have the so-called intrinsic pathway and extrinsic pathway. And under normal circumstances, both these pathways tend to kick in simultaneously. It's pretty rare that only the intrinsic pathway would kick in and not the extrinsic pathway. And I will differentiate between these pathways a little bit more on the next slide. Both of these pathways, with the help of the activation of clotting factors, 
are going to ultimately produce clotting factor 10. And once we have clotting factor 10, we can essentially kick into our common pathway with the help of yet another proenzyme called the prothrombin activator. Before I compare and contrast the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway, let's focus here for a moment on the common pathway. Both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway, remember, are ultimately going to produce uh, clotting factor 10. And once we have clotting factor 10, then a prothrombin activator or prothrombinase can convert prothrombin into thrombin. So again, prothrombin being inactive and thrombin being active, an active clotting factor. Thrombin already tells you what it's doing. Thrombin, as in the word uh, thrombosis or thrombus, right? Thrombosis is the condition where a person has developed a thrombus, that is a clot in their blood. Once we have thrombin, thrombin can then catalyze the conversion of an inactive uh, fibrinogen to fibrin. And fibrin is basically the name of the protein that forms the little strands uh, during a clot. So this is the point when blood proves that it's indeed a connective tissue, as in it can produce fibers. Fibrin consists of, is an insoluble protein, again, which makes it, or which allows it to form a clot. And once these fibers begin to be laid down, they create this little mesh in which, of course, all kinds of formed elements can get trapped. Let's compare contrast the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. The intrinsic pathway gets its name because it starts inside of a damaged blood vessel or in the lab, inside of a lab test tube. Now, if it were to occur just by itself, if we could literally isolate it, it would still eventually form factor X, which then results into thrombin, but this pathway takes longer, it's slower. And if you take a look at the, one of the previous slides where I show you all the clotting factors involved, then you will see that the intrinsic pathway has many more steps than the extrinsic pathway, uh, which occurs faster. But because it occurs faster, notice it produces less thrombin ultimately. So why is it called the extrinsic pathway? Because that's the pathway that kicks in when there's damage to the surrounding tissue of a blood vessel. And because of that damage to the surrounding tissue, we see that tissue factor is produced or factor three, or you can see all the different synonyms for it here. So the extrinsic pathway must have access to the tissue factor to, um, to allow for the um, clotting mechanism, mechanism to kick in. But just to reiterate, in real life, more than likely both pathways co-occur. They both kick in and they both will contribute to the formation of thrombin. This then wraps up our discussion of hemostasis. Remember, hemostasis literally means the stopping of the flow of blood, which starts with uh, a vascular spasm followed by the formation of a platelet plug, followed finally by the process of coagulation. Now that the clot is formed, we need to get rid of that clot eventually. So that's the focus of the next video.